When Ron went to see Noah's Ark in 1977, he realized there was nothing he could do at that point in time. So it's as if God had impressed him with and placed a burden on his heart to find the crossing site and where the exodus took place. So that's when he rented an airplane and he lot. And from this airplane, he flew up and down the, the shore of the Gulf of Aqaba to see if he could find a wadi that would allow the Israelites to come across. So as he flew up and down, he saw this huge beach, which was Nueva. And um, what he did after that was when they flew back, they drove down and began to dive. Now, it was a miracle that they were allowed to do that because God had this happen exactly when Israel was in control of the Sinai Peninsula. They could have never done this if it was under Egyptian control. So that's the first miracle, in my opinion. In later years, a couple of years later, Ron took Rennie Norbergen with him to the beach to show him. And Rennie wrote about it in his book here that you can see. And he told Mr. Norbergen that he believed it was Jabal El Laws. So when he looked at the flight maps that he was able to get, he saw an area that appeared to be enclosed in the rim of an ancient volcano. And to the best of his um, figures, he came up with an area of about 5,000 square acres. And he knew that would certainly be large enough to be the camp of the Israelites. Ron had applied for a visa to get into Saudi Arabia for four years. He tried hard. He wrote to the embassy and uh, it, it was impossible to get a visa in. So he had arranged for him and Ronnie and Danny to slip across the border. And when they did that, they were able to pick a, a taxi who drove them out so far and then they got another ride and they made it right to the mountain. And it was the Bedouin who, who said, oh, Jabal Musa Henna. And they knew they were in the right place. And what Ron saw on that first trip, there were no fences back then. There was nobody living there. And he was able to drive actually into the Holy Precinct area, they just drove right in and around and he saw everything. He saw, um, he saw what looked like an altar to him. He saw a lot of stuff that day, but then they had to leave. They were run out when they came out, they were run out of the area. And so as they got back to the border, um, they thought everything was going to be okay. They were just going to slip across the border. And if they were caught, what Ron had found out was, that if you're caught illegally in there, they will just kick you out of the country. But it didn't happen because someone had reported them to the embassy in Washington, D.C. as being Israeli spies. Now, I'm not going to reveal the name of that person because he's not here to defend himself. So, um, and it's, it's really irrelevant because in the end, it worked out to God's glory because Ron was able to go on TV and national TV and tell the world what he saw out there and even quote Bible scriptures. Now, while he was arrested, it was, a, it was not an easy experience for him, but he said they had some nice people there. One of them especially, whose name was Ollie. Um, he was a very kind man. They were in a place called Hagel, which is a city just south of the Jordanian border, right on the coast. And they were arrested by the Coast Guard, and they were held there. And due to the nature of what they were charged with, they were treated kind of rough at first. But when they got there, there had been a lot of sickness. And Ron investigated and found out that what was going on was probably yellow fever because several men had died, and the whole area was infested with uh, mosquitoes. So Ron asked them to get him a lot of olive oil and he wrote out prescriptions. When he told them he was an anesthetist, they didn't understand that. And finally he told them he was a sleep doctor and they understood that, that he put people to sleep for surgery. 
So they accepted his prescriptions. He wrote a prescription for antibiotics. They brought it back. Everyone began taking them. They killed all of the mosquitoes. They put it in their toilet. They put it in the standing water. And from that time on, everyone got well. So they were, that had gotten them into the good graces of the Saudis. And I think that was the first real miracle that helped both them and the Saudis. Now, another interesting story is they, three men, three Saudi investigators came to Ron and they were pounding him, why do you think Musa would have brought the people to here? There's nothing here. Show us your evidence. And they put him in a helicopter, only Ron and these three men. And they said, you show us where you think the crossing took place. And Ron took them. He could see across the Gulf. He could see Nueva. So what he did is he pointed them down to a place to land right on the beach opposite Nueva. And when they got there, the second miracle happened because it was an absolute miracle. Right where they landed was a column still standing on the beach that matched one Ron had found on the Egyptian side a few years earlier, only the one on the Egyptian side had all of the writing eroded where it had laid in the surf. And when these men saw this column and, and saw that it had um, ancient writing on it, they, I think that this gave Ron a lot of credibility and really saved their lives. That's what I believe. And so then when they went back, um, there was, uh, Ronnie was not doing well at all. Ronnie, Ron knew that Ronnie was about to crack. And Ronnie says, I've got to get out of here. And Ron knew they had to make an escape. And he said, okay, we'll do it the next Thursday or whatever it was. But he said, oh no, we can't because Ollie's on guard. And if we escape while Ollie's here, they'll kill him. And so Ronnie said, okay, we'll wait. But that was the Thursday. That Wednesday, the day before they were going to try to escape, was when they came to him and they said, Halas, it is finished. You're going home. And at that point, uh, they were turned over to the Jordanians for three days, and then they came home. They were in prison there for a total of 75 days in Saudi, and then three additional days in Jordan. Ron was unable to bring home any documentation, but he believed that the column contained the name Solomon, Mizram, Edom, um, Death. After Ron and the boys got home from being in prison, Ron swore he would never go back there again. He, he was he was aware of the dangers now. But in 1980, late in 1984, Ron met a man named uh, David Fasselt who wanted to go see Noah's Ark. And this story sort of interlocks with this because also about that same time, a man from Saudi who he later learned was a prince and probably related to the king in some point, in some way, I don't know how, I contacted Ron and he said, I've heard your story and ever since I've heard it, I can't do anything. I cannot function. I have to see this mountain. His name was Samran Almateri and he lived in Tabuk. And uh, we were told that he was a prince of Tabuk. I don't understand the connections, so I can't go into that. But Samran actually flew to Nashville and visited with Ron. And he said, you have to take me to this mountain. I'll get you visas. I'll get you out there. I have to see it. And uh, Ron said, well, I'll tell you what. Um, why don't you come to Noah's Ark with me? I'm taking a man there. And this was at the end of March in um, 1985. So Samaron went out to Noah's Ark with Ron when he took David Fasselt out there. And there was snow on the mountain and covering Noah's Ark. But Samaron believed this man is telling the truth. There is something here. And that gave him even more uh, 
you know, more credibility with Samran. So Samran said, you've got to come. To Come on, I'll get you visas. Mr. Fassel, you can come too. Because he had seen David Fassel working some of his uh, magic with his, his equipment, his detection equipment. So they all went out there. And uh, when they were out there, they were guests of Samran. They had a contract to do some um, work on mining purposes. So when they were out there with a the dig crew, they uh, did find, they dug into this one area that Ron believed was a well. And at 20 feet down into that well, they found a gold bracelet. And at, it was at that point that they were all put under house arrest again. They found a lot of things when they were there because they were given free run of the area. And Ron found a white marble piece that had what he believed was archaic Hebrew on it. And he hid it because he knew that if he showed it to anyone, it would be destroyed. And we keep hoping that someone can find that because, well, it'd be very difficult out there to find anything, but it's still out there, I do believe. After they were put under house arrest, they did bring in a, an archeologist from Riyadh who met them at Samran's complex out there. And they looked at David Fassel's videotapes showing the, gold, the calves on the golden calf altar and different things. And this was the archaeologist who said, these are not found anywhere else in Saudi Arabia, only out here. And when he saw the evidences for himself, that's when the entire area was fenced off and put under archaeological control and made off limits to everyone. After they had... Uh, had everything confiscated from them. For years, Ron was just desperate to try to get photos, all to no avail. It was in the late 80s when we read an article uh, claiming that um, Mr. Cornuk was claiming he had found Mount Sinai. And at first we were really excited, but then we discovered that he had no you know, no plans for him or Mr. Williams, who was with him, uh, to share the photos with anyone. And they had their own story about what happened. And we learned that the way that they found it, because this, this mountain is not an easy thing to find. It's, it's not. It's like trying to find a grain of sand on the beach. So I'll read from the beginning from the beginning of their book in the foreword, which David Fassel wrote. He said, was Larry afraid to give it a try, talking about sneaking into Mount Sinai? He says, nah, would I go with him? He says, well, not exactly, but I'd give him a map. He had told him everything about Ron's story. And so in the books that followed, their story also includes um, episodes where they claim they told people they were doctors and so all Ron could do was pray about it and he kept trying to contact Samaron and see it because Samaron had claimed that he could get the photos and videos and get it to us. He was asking large amounts of money, m more than we would ever see in our lifetime. And then um, finally there was a time when we went to Nueva. This was in January of 1992. When we were in Nueva, um, I had brought a map with me to Saudi Arabia. I don't know why. Uh, this was not something Ron and I talked about, but I had put three copies in my luggage, mainly because we had just bought a fax machine and I could make copies with it. So I had those in my purse, and we're out at Nueva, and Samaran speaks English, but his wives do not. So we would have Ahmed Sami, who was the man who worked at the desk in Nueva at our hotel. He would try to call for us, and then he would uh, interpret to the wives since they couldn't speak English because Samaran was never there. Finally, when Ahmed Sami figured something was going on here, he said, tell me about this. Maybe I can help you. So, and we just called him Sammy. And Ron explained to him that there was Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia. 
And then he told him about his other discoveries, about Noah's Ark and all of these things. And Ahmed Sami had this great idea. He says, I can get this for you. He says, every Muslim is allowed to go on a Hajj visa to Saudi Arabia once in their lifetime. In fact, we have to. He says, I've never gone on mine. And so the deal was we gave him some money to buy a ticket over there. We left him a camera and Ron even gave him 500 extra dollars to go over there. Now, when we got home, we got a call from Ahmed Sami, who's saying, I need more money. This is going to cost more than I thought. So I, I'm the stingy one in the family. <laughs> Ron was quite willing to give him more money, so I said, okay. So I go to the bank. I made the wire transfer based on the instructions Sammy had given us. And I think it was another $1,500. I can't remember exactly. But I kept saying, Ron, this, we're just throwing away money. I got a call from the bank that the wire didn't go through because there was a number missing, and a wire number missing. And I needed to get that. So Ron had me call Ahmed Sammy, and I called him, and I got that number. And I called the bank back the next morning and told them I wanted to go ahead and make that wire, and here was the number. And they told me, well, you're going to have to come in. We can't, we can't do bank wire transfers over the phone. So I went down to the bank, and I gave them the information. And when I got home, we got the call that they couldn't make the wire because their wire system was down for the afternoon. That would be the next morning. Well, what happened right after that was a miracle. Ron got a phone call from a girl who said that she didn't know what this was about, but her brother had called her and said, find this man named Ron Wyatt and give him my number and tell him to call me. And when I looked at Ron's face, he turned white as a sheet while he was on that phone. And I said, what? I didn't know if someone had died or what. And he said, I don't know. And he immediately called this number in Saudi Arabia. And this man answered. And his name was Jim Caldwell. The Caldwells were a family who were working, living and working in Saudi Arabia near Riyadh. He worked for Aramco. And so they had to go out of the country every so often uh, to keep their tax status with, with the United States. So in their trip that they had to take to leave the kingdom, they came into Egypt. They were especially interested in going to see St. Caterina's or St. Catherine's in the Sinai Peninsula. This is supposedly the, the real Mount Sinai, but it's the traditional site. It was uh, located by dreams and mysticism from uh, the mother of Constantine. That's how it was located. So anyhow, they went out there and they came away very, very disappointed because they knew they had not seen the real thing. And when they had left Nueva, they had been at the same hotel that we had been at, and Sammy there knew that they lived in Saudi Arabia. So when they came back through that second time after their trip, which was right after we had left, uh, he was very excited. He had already figured out what he was going to do, how he was going to get the the footage and how I was going to collect a grand sum from Ron Wyatt. When they came back, Ahmed Sammy told him, "There's, you've got to do this for me," and and he was trying to get Jim and his wife Penny to make these photos for him and then give them to his brother in Saudi, who would give them to him. And I'm sure the Caldwells were quite concerned. You know, what is he talking about? And I, I, I want to let you hear them tell the story, but I'm going to go ahead and tell it because you can't hear the video real good. They said when they got there, Ahmed Sammy told them a story about a man who had just been there. And it had something to do with the ark and, and you know, Mount Sinai. And they didn't know what it was all about. But finally, 
Jim said he figured out that it was Noah's Ark. And Jim said something went off in his brain that his sister had sent him a videotape the year before about a man who said he had found Noah's Ark. And that man was Ron Wyatt. And so what Jim would do, he said, was he'd take these tapes. They would come in on eight millimeter tapes because they were small. And he would transfer them to a, a VHS tape. And then he would reuse the eight millimeter tapes. I imagine it's kind of hard to get tapes over in Saudi. So him and his wife and his two kids, they're doing their usual out of the kingdom uh, visit that you have to do when you work over there every so often to keep your tax status. And they had just gone to St. Catherine's and were very disappointed because they thought it was the real Mount Sinai. And they had really wanted to see that, but they didn't. So when they got back, and they, they were praying and studying and wanting to see the real Mount Sinai. And so there's more to their story, which they can tell. But when they got there and Ahmed Sammy told them this story, Jim said, he thought a minute, he said, I brought 10 tapes with me on this trip and to use, and I've used nine of them. I wonder if the one I haven't used, and he put it in his video recorder, played it, put it up to Ahmed Sammy's eye, and Ahmed Sammy said, that's him, that's the man. He had not used the tape that had Ron on there. And they were all very, I mean, that was a miracle. That was a miracle right there. And we had left a map with Ahmed Sammy, and Ron had me draw a cow on there. Then he had me draw the mountain with a tree between two boulders and some other things. I, I don't remember all of it. But Jim and Penny went there right when they left Nueva, took their car, and on their way home, they went to Mount Sinai and they made all these pictures. And when they got them, they called Ron and said, we want you to have these. So a few weeks later, Ron flew to Bahrain and met them over there because you can fly freely to Bahrain, but you can't Saudi, and it was very quick and easy for them to come there. So they gave us not only copies of the video, they gave us the all their photos, and they gave us even the negatives. And this continued for quite a while. They would, um, Ron went over there a couple of times. They had a place, they called it the Mexican restaurant. They, they spoke in code over the phone because I think everyone was rather nervous about what they were doing, especially them, because they lived there. So all the pictures and videos that they brought to us, I honestly believe that was the happiest I'd ever seen Ron and, you know, in anything relating to all of this work that we had been doing because for so long he had wanted to show people. Ron didn't do this to gain any fame or fortune or anything like that. Ron just wanted people to see what God had preserved for them. and. I don't believe anybody could have done a better job of photographing and videoing back then, back in the early 90s with the equipment that was available to people back then. I don't believe anybody could have ever done a better job than they did. And I will always be grateful for what they did. Vivica, I will always admire her for what she did because Vivica, Pontin heard Ron speak, I think in Norway or Sweden, and um, she heard this before he was able to get the photos and everything, and she wanted to go and help Ron have some photos. So that girl, she was single, and she got a job at a hospital in Tabuk, and I don't know how she did it, but she recruited lots of people to take her out to the mountain, and she made all of these photos and videos and just gave them right to Ron. I remember one time there was a, a, a young man who was working with her, Toby. And she had gone out to the mountain with Toby and she had shot a lot of rolls of film, slides. And when Toby and them got back, they found out that Toby's sister back in the U.S. had been in a terrible accident 
and Toby had to go back to the U.S. So Vivica gave Toby all of these rolls of film, and when Toby got back to the U.S., we arranged, and I took my mama, and she and I, we drove up to Kentucky and met with him, and he gave us all the film and everything, and they were magnificent. They were the first pictures that we had up close of the altar of Moses in the Holy Precinct area. Vivica was amazing. She went diving. She got some amazing footage while she was diving of what looked to be chariot parts. Uh, she said she didn't even see them at the time. What she would do is she would just film. Ron had met her in Cairo and taken her a underwater camera. And so she was just diving and filming and did an incredible job. And so we have um, what Vivica did. She just gave us everything. And she wanted no credit for anything. She, she was of the same heart, still is, of the same heart that Ron was. She just wanted people to make it to heaven. We had a man come to visit us from Sweden by the name of Rory. And um, we got to know him, and he told us about his friend Leonard. And so um, Leonard was very interested in the discoveries, and he was a highly educated man. He was a genetic geneticist at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. And so Leonard came to visit us a few times, and he drew up a contract with Ron. He wanted to write a book about all these discoveries with Ron. Ron was going to be co-author. And so um, Leonard came, and he even came to visit Ron when he was sick and dying, but they never got the book written. So after Ron died, um, Leonard came to see me. I think it was in October of 99. He came, and um, he wanted to write the book. And he said he would, um, he needed to be the only person on the cover because of his credibility. I was still grieving Ron very much, and so he drew up a contract. It was a strange contract. It was in two parts. Um, one part of it was the contract to write the book. The other part of it was the contract that he could use the pictures. So I gave him all of my research. He, we went downstairs where all the books are, and I gave him all the research, and then he went back to Sweden and he wrote the book. And he, would, he sent me two or three uh, different manuscripts because I had the right of refusal. I had to, got to check it and everything. And it was an excellent book, and it was all about Ron's work. But the only place in there where it told was one little paragraph that said, this is based on you know, the research and discoveries and field work of Ron Wyatt. And anyhow, um, Ron had taken him diving a couple times and showed him everything. And after the book came out, I no longer heard from Leonard anymore, even though I was supposed to receive 50% of the proceeds. Um, so anyhow, um, he became pretty well known as a writer for writing all of that. And, People think that it was the research of Leonard Moeller, but it was not. It was the work of God through Ron Wyatt, and people need to know that. No matter how many degrees you have, no matter how intelligent you are, without God, you cannot do anything. I mean, you can do something to impress man, but you can't, you can't impress God. And so um, it's, it's, rather, it's rather sad that Ron told me that day when we were talking about, about this, he said, when I'm gone, this was right before we went out the door to take him to the hospital where he died. He said, when I'm gone, everyone will be jockeying for position. I was... You know, my mind was elsewhere. I did not know what he meant, but I never forgot what he said. And so the whole story of these things needs to be known. There's a lot of people who did a lot of wonderful things, a lot of wonderful things. But God is supposed to have the glory. 
because he did these things, he preserved these things for this time in history. Ron had said many times in his meetings in different places and to me and to other people that it was very important that people know that he made the discoveries because that was the only way people would know that God did it. Because Ron gave God all the credit. Ron knew he didn't do this on his own. He knew that no human being contained the wisdom to find the things that God had hidden from humanity all of these years and find these things all in such a short period of time. Ron didn't want the credit. It was something, well, for example, I used to think about Moses. Moses had to write the first five books of the Bible. He had to write about himself. And one of the things that it says about Moses is that he was one of the most humble men of above all. Now, he had to write that about himself, but he was impressed by God to write it. Think about everything that a, a person who's doing the work of God has to do. And it, you know, in order for God to receive the glory and the credit of such a, a magnificent thing as this, it has to be stated that God used this person to do it. He used a person who was faithful, a person who had no ulterior motive, who had no want or desire for fame or fortune. And Ron did not have that. He just flat didn't. And this is all part of, of God's glory, not of man's.